Welcome back into the conversation. It's Adrian Lawrence, and this time I am joined by Democratic strategist and attorney and managing partner of the Chavis Law Group, Kevin Chavis. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yes, yeah, so Kevin, on Friday, we concluded day 10 of the Derek Chauvin trial, and one of the right. most anticipated witnesses testified. That's Dr. Andrew Baker of the Hennepin County Medical Examiner. He's the one who performed that initial autopsy of George Floyd. What stuck out to you about Dr. Baker's testimony? Well, I thought he he clarified what he meant in his um, you know, in his death certificate when he stated the cause of death. The, Homocardinary, homocardinary arrest, um, you know, related to the restraint and the subdual and the and everything. He said that it meant in the pertaining to or in the matter of, I think was the language. So he he basically was saying that the arrest did occur uh, in not so many words because of the knee on the neck. Uh, so I think that that was good for the state that he seemed to tie the the cardiac event to the knee being on the neck. That was important. I think that was the point they were trying to get from him. So I thought he was good for the state when he when he clarified that and made more of a link between the knee being on the neck, that restraint and the, the compression to the heart attack that followed shortly thereafter. Yes, that very much seemed to be very important testimony because if he's saying essentially in his report that it was cardiac arrest, then it gives the defense more leeway to say that it was not the restraint on the neck. But if the restraint on the neck is what produced the cardiac arrest, that is so important. And so as you noted, that's extremely impactful for that testimony there. And we also know that the jurors happen to hear from a Dr. Lindsay Thomas. She's a forensic pathologist. She also helped train Dr. Baker. And Dr. Thomas seemed to say that she believed that George Floyd died from a lack of oxygen that was caused by Chauvin kneeling on the neck. She seemed to be very direct in this regard. How would you interpret her testimony in terms of the impact that it had for the parties involved? Yes, you're right. She was much more direct and I thought she was probably their best witness of the day, maybe even of the last couple of days. The police chief I thought was very impactful too. But her testimony was great. You know, like you said, she she trained the current county examiner. She also had over 30 years of experience, over 3000 or something autopsies that she's done. I mean, her resume is incredible. And she spoke without any real hesitation. You know, she talked about her experience dealing with people who had overdoses from meth, methamphetamine or fentanyl. And she said that this was not that. You know, what I saw in that video was not an overdose. She said that with, with conviction. I thought that was a great moment for the state. Um, and you know, the defense in previous days had been criticizing some of the other uh, medical experts because they weren't forensic pathologists. The defense attorney was quick to point that out. Well, she's like the ultimate uh, forensic pathologist. They couldn't use that with her and she was very direct. I thought it was she was a great witness for the state. I think they'd be very happy with 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 her testimony. Oh yes, I I absolutely agree with that. She seemed very cool, calm, collected, neutral. Yeah. Also, the way in which she spoke about uh, the death and how the bodies work, you can tell yeah. that woman has seen a body or two, and it is she is a clinician. Yeah. Uh, she she handled her testimony almost in a very surgical way, and it seemed to be very beneficial for the prosecution in that case. And it seemed that she had suggested or at least practically just said that Floyd would not have died but for the actions actions of Officer Chauvin. So also yeah. too, to kind of transition away from that to go to more of the defensive side. Mm. They had observed that there was a toxicology report that found that there were methamphetamines and fentanyl in George Floyd's system. Plus there were pill fragments found at the scene. Even though Dr. Baker said she did not find any pill fragments in his stomach. How do you think that that impacted the jury? Well, look, the defense, all they're trying to do is just get one juror to, to say there's enough reasonable doubt here that we don't feel we can convict off you know, the defendant, Derek Chauvin. So they're doing what's expected. Um, they're trying as much as possible to make this about um, any drug problem that drug Floyd may have had, um, anything he had in his system. So I, I don't think that, I thought it was damaging that they found he didn't have the pill fragments in his system at the time, that, that wasn't good. Um, you know, Previously, I think when they had, George Floyd's former girlfriend 
on the stand and she admitted to him overdosing at one point. I thought that was one of their highlights when it comes to talking about his past um, drug problem uh, and experiences with, with potential overdoses. That was a good moment for them. I don't think they have quite reached that, that level since. Uh, we'll see moving forward, but it's hard to say exactly how a jury will react. But I know that that was sort of par for the course with the way the defense is expected to attack that issue, you know, in the trial. Yes, it definitely seemed like the defense was going for that kind of implication that it was drugs and right, it yeah. was not the officer's knee on this man's neck for several minutes. Which, you know, it hey, as you have. Um, Kind of keenly observe the fact that there might be one juror out there who's willing to kind of just embrace that and go with it. Um, but I guess we will see how that all turns out. So we're going to have to expect coming up at some point in time that the defense will call its case and its witnesses. Who do you think would potentially be strongest for the defense? Well, they're, they're probably going to try to, to call some, some law enforcement individuals who will speak to um, training. Where that will, you know, sort of say that, hey, these type of neck constraints or neck compressions are used and are valid things to to employ when dealing with um, a defendant or an arrestee who may be a little bit frantic, a little bit out of control. They'll probably show some of the same video where where George Floyd was, um, you know, saying, hey, I can't breathe or I'm claustrophobic and was struggling to get on the ground. So they'll probably do some of what the, the, the state did in, in calling even people from outside of Minnesota to come in and say, hey, we, you know, our department does authorize that or has trained um, officers to use similar, similar tactics. Um, and I think that a, a big thing though for the defense, you know, this case is so unique because of the, the mountains of video evidence we have and it's so striking the video. So there's not much that the defense can do. Um, in the face of those videos. In week one, it was very emotional, it was very powerful hearing those witnesses testify, you know, and taking us back to that day and painting the picture for what it was like. So I think the defense will probably call way less witnesses for sure. And they'll try to, you know, also call some medical experts of their own to testify that, hey, his heart condition probably was a result of years of, of drug abuse and those, just to say those things more clearly. Um, again, it remains to be seen how that will, will play um, and what the prosecution will do on cross. But I certainly anticipate the defense's uh, witness list to be much smaller um, and it won't take as much time to get through their witnesses, I would anticipate. Absolutely. And do you actually think Chauvin will testify? Um, that is a good question. Um, he may, but I don't, I don't think so. You know, but it's hard to say. Uh, one thing that I think will be interesting um, is that in Minnesota they have the spark of life doctrine. I don't know if you've heard about that, but it allows for you know parties to call witnesses who can try to human humanize the victim, which is usually not really allowed until sentencing. But in Minnesota they had a 1985 case that allows individuals to be called simply just to talk about, hey, this guy. You know, was a person talk about memories they had with them as a child and everything. But they'll have to be careful because they're not supposed to get into character witness or character evidence. So they shouldn't say, you know, oh George Floyd, he was such a gentle guy, or he was a big guy, but he was a gentle giant. You know, and it's sometimes difficult for witnesses to to stay sort of disciplined. And if they do cross the line, that will open the door for the defense to bring in negative character evidence. So I'm looking forward to that because this is only allowed really in Minnesota. I'm looking forward to see what the state does next week, probably at the end of next week. I think they're gonna call maybe his sibling and one of his friends. Hopefully those two witnesses, if you're in the state, you know, stick to the script, don't go too far because they don't wanna open the door for more evidence about you know, past drug use or any violent tendencies, anything like that. That would not be good for the state. So I think that's something definitely to keep an eye on um, as we move forward. 
Absolutely, and as we kind of, uh, as a nation, start to grapple more and understand more drug use and to humanize individuals involved in drug use and understand that drug use doesn't necessarily equate to criminality or uh, violence necessarily. Uh, I think that that's an important lesson that we have these conversations and continue to learn from them. And uh, we only have about a minute left, but I would love to hear your thoughts in terms of how do you think this is all gonna shake out based on what you've seen so far? Well, in all honesty, you know, to me, the, the video evidence is so clear and so damning that I don't see how he couldn't, how Chauvin couldn't at least be found guilty for the negligent homicide, you know, for, for count three. Um, even if you say he didn't intend to, to kill him or, you know, didn't do anything reckless or wanton, it, you know, it at least was, was beyond what a reasonable person would, would expect someone to do in that situation. Um, especially once his pulse stopped and you know and all those things. But again, that one juror, they, if the defense can find one juror that is buying their story and that is that is more concerned with the drug use or whatever it is, you know, we could we could see a, a result that most of us will not like. We've seen it before, but I think that he will be convicted at least of the negligent manslaughter. Um, I think the the expert witnesses and the forensic witnesses were very very compelling. I think this week was great for the prosecution. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin, I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges, you've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun, but you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air, so all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video, thank you.